So welcome everyone to this webinar on progress on household drinking water sanitation five years into the SDGs. My name is Rick Johnston. I'm from WHO and I co-lead the joint monitoring program with my colleague Tom Slaymaker at UNICEF. And we'll be going through several different areas of, of highlights from the report which just came out this last summer. First, we'll speak about drinking water services, then sanitation, then hygiene, and then finally a new area for the GMP, menstrual health. But before I hand over to Tom to take us through an information background, I'm just going to share some words from the head of the vice chair of UN Water, Kelly Ann Naylor. I'm just trying to get to the right screen now, so bear with me for a second. Very much for joining this. Okay. Dear colleagues and friends of water. Thank you very much for joining this webinar today to discuss progress towards Sustainable Development Goal 6. This webinar is part of a series of webinars taking place this month, each focusing on global progress towards a specific SDG 6 indicator and target. Before we get into the details, I wanted to share a few important messages about overall progress towards SDG 6 and how the UN is working together to report on our progress. We are now six years into the SDGs, and for the first time, we have water and sanitation data from almost all the countries in the world. This country data were compiled last year by the UN custodian agencies who joined forces under the UN Water Integrated Monitoring Initiative for SDG 6, or as we fondly call it, IMI SDG 6. The unprecedented level of, of reporting is a major accomplishment for us as a global community, but even more so for all the country focal points who are joining us in this webinar. On behalf of UN Water, I would like to thank all of you for your extra hard efforts in monitoring SDG 6 in your country this year, especially in the difficult times we've been all living through. When we look at this data, they sadly confirmed the tendency that we first saw in 2018, that we are off track to achieve sustainable water and sanitation for all by 2030. Taking a look at some of the hard facts about SDG 6, we see that billions of people worldwide still live without safe water and sanitation and basic hygiene services. Nearly 10% of the world's population still live in areas with extreme water stress. We know that wastewater is being released untreated into the environment and one in five of the world's river basins are changing rapidly, which is exacerbated by changes in climate. We see that sustainable management of water resources remains out of reach for many countries. The data show that in order to meet our goals and targets, we are going to need to accelerate progress and in some areas up to four times faster to be able to meet SDG 6 within the next nine years. More than anything, we're going to need politicians and policymakers at all levels to be able to set bolder priorities and quickly. But the good news is, is that we already have a lot of sustainable solutions in place. Last year, UN Water launched the SDG 6 Global Acceleration Framework with the full backing of the UN family to mobilize action across government, civil society, and the private sector across the UN to be able to better align our efforts, optimize financing, and enhance capacity and governance. From our work with countries and from their data, we've learned a lot about opportunities for accelerating progress. We've learned about the importance of scaling up capacity building, coordinated action, mobilizing political will. And of course, we've learned how data and information can be used to better guide policy and decision makers in their work. Because despite these heroic monitoring efforts of the last year, we still see large data gaps. 
Our ambition and hope with this data and with our SDG 6 reports are to for further encourage and support national and subnational data collection and ultimately help policy and decision makers to take informed action. This is what IMI SDG 6 will be focusing on as we go forward, and we call on the entire water community from global to local efforts to join us in taking this forward. I wish you a very fruitful and lively webinar today and very warmly welcome you to join the other indicator webinars that we're organizing this month. Thank you for your attention and for all of your continued efforts to drive progress towards our common goal to ensure availability and sustainable management of water and sanitation for all. Thank you very much. OK, so thanks to Kelly for a nice uh, introduction. Uh, setting the scene, I'm going to uh, give a few uh, background slides um, introducing uh, global monitoring of uh, SDG targets for drinking water, sanitation and hygiene. And then we will uh, use our time over the next couple of hours as follows. We'll start with drinking water, um, move through to sanitation, onto hygiene and menstrual health. And after each of those, we will have an opportunity for discussion and for Q&A. Uh, so please do uh, type your questions uh, as we go along and you will have opportunities to, um, to raise your hand and speak if you wish to do so. But Rick, if you could go to the next slide, please. Uh, so as Kelly says, uh, uh, the IMI SDG6 initiative is an umbrella initiative bringing together the custodian agencies uh, responsible for monitoring different aspects of SDG 6. Um, there are 12 indicators and uh, 11 custodian agencies, uh, but this uh, webinar is going to focus uh, primarily on 6.1.1 and 6.2.1, which are the uh, global indicators for drinking water and for sanitation and for hygiene. So three global indicators uh, which form the basis uh, for global monitoring of these targets. Um, but the indicators uh, relating to, to WASH are not limited to SDG 6. On the next slide, you'll see that we also have um, targets and indicators under SDG 1, uh, which is about uh, universal access to basic services, including basic drinking water, sanitation and hygiene. Um, there is also a target under SDG 4 on education facilities, which includes indicators for washing schools. And there is a target under SDG 3 for universal health coverage, which covers a wide range of issues relating to quality of care, including washing healthcare facilities. So for the purposes of this uh, uh, webinar, we'll be focusing mainly on SDG 6, but we should bear in mind that there are also targets and indicators under other goals. Um, the other important thing to recognize, if you've read the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, you will see that these global targets are aspirational. Um, and the intention is that individual governments will set their own national targets, guided by the global ambition, but also taking into account uh, national circumstances. What we're seeing is that uh, increasingly, uh, national governments are setting targets which are in line with the SDG ambitions, aiming for universal coverage and higher levels of service. Um, but what this means is that there will need to be a dramatic increase in performance in order to meet these targets going forward. Now, the role of the custodian agencies um, is essentially to provide internationally comparable data that can be used to benchmark and track progress across countries over time. But we also have a responsibility to maintain the global databases uh, to help to develop um, standards around uh, indicator definitions and methodologies for monitoring. Um, and we work very closely with uh, the national authorities who are responsible for national statistics on drinking water, sanitation and hygiene to help to build capacity and also to establish uh, systems which allow us to compile national data and consult with countries uh, to verify um, how they're being used uh, for the production of international estimates. And the data that we produce 
as the WHO, UNICEF, JMP are then fed into uh, the official uh, SDG global reports, which come out every July and are published by the Secretary General and discussed by the member states of the UN. Now, the JMP is uh, getting into a pattern of producing updates every two years uh, for different settings. So last year in 2020, we produced updates for schools and for healthcare facilities, and we will produce updates for schools and healthcare facilities again in 2022. So those come out in, in even years. And this year in 2021, we produced a progress update for households. And the JMP will continue to produce updates um, every two years for households for the remainder of the SDG period. And to support uh, countries to um, develop questions and indicators that can be integrated within national monitoring systems, we've developed what we call our core questions. There are core questions for household surveys and also core questions for monitoring WASH in schools and monitoring WASH in healthcare facilities. These are available on our website in all of the UN languages, and they have been increasingly incorporated into national monitoring systems over the first five years of the SDG period. We also maintain what we call JMP country files. So for each of the 234 countries, areas, and territories in the JMP global database, we maintain an Excel spreadsheet, which includes or a list of all of the national data sources which we have so far identified that can be used to produce internationally comparable estimates. And the country file uh, contains information on how those data have been used, which data sets have been used to produce the estimates, and which data sets have not been used as a result of the country consultations. And the Last important thing to say here is that the JMP country consultation is a formal process uh, which is happening every two years prior to the publication of a progress update. So before publishing a report, uh, we will circulate country files uh, through the WHO and UNICEF regional and country offices uh, to national authorities along with some guidance on how to interpret the country file, and we will request technical feedback from the national authorities on the estimates that we have produced based on national data. Um, in many cases, that will require some consultation with the National Statistical Office, but also the Ministry of Water, Ministry of Health, the Ministry of, of, of Environment, and possibly also regulatory authorities who are responsible for drinking water, sanitation, and hygiene services. But essentially, the questions we ask in a country consultation are, is the, um, is the country file missing any relevant national data sources that we should be aware of? Um, are those data sources that have been used considered reliable, or should we not be using some of them? And is our interpretation and our classification of the national data sources correct? So this is the basis of the country consultation. We then receive feedback. Uh, through our regional and country offices, um, and we use the, the, the feedback uh, to update the estimates. Uh, our next round of country consultations will be held at the end of this year in November and December, when we will be consulting on our updated estimates for schools and for healthcare facilities. Uh, there will be a, a two-month period of, of, of consultation, and then the estimates will be finalised in early 2022 and published around the middle of 2022 in June or July. So this is the, the cycle of JMP updates. And in this webinar, we're going to be talking about the most recent JMP 2021 progress report, which was focused on household drinking water, sanitation and hygiene. Um, the JMP Global Database contains nearly 7,000 national data sets, of which around 4,500 were used in the last report. About half of those are coming from censuses and from household surveys, and around half are coming from administrative data, including from, from regulators. Uh, there are over 3,000 uh, data sets on drinking water and, and sanitation, but just over 200 on, on hygiene. Um, almost all of the hygiene data comes from, from household surveys. 
And the JMP has also established a new global database on menstrual health, which currently includes uh, around 46 data sets. Um, and those are also coming primarily from household surveys. So those were the data that went into the report. Um, and very briefly, uh, these were the, the headline findings. So the report was assessing progress over the first five years of the SDG period between 2015 and 2020. Uh, we analyzed annual rates of change since 2000, and we used those to illustrate current trajectories and also the acceleration required in order to meet the 2030 targets. So this chart is showing you um, that while the world is essentially on track uh, to eliminate open defecation by 2030, uh, that's shown there in orange, um, acceleration is going to be required in order to reach universal coverage of basic services. So for example, achieving universal coverage of even basic drinking water, that's shown there in light blue, and basic sanitation shown in light green, will require a doubling of current rates of progress. And then when we turn to the SDG global indicators, so achieving universal coverage of safely managed drinking water, safely managed sanitation, and basic hygiene, this is gonna be even more challenging and will effectively require a quadrupling, a four times increase in current global rates of progress. The other key theme that emerged from the report was around the fact that um, it is people living in, in fragile contexts who are likely to have much lower levels of service in all regions of the world and uh, are likely to find it hardest to meet these global targets. Um, fragility obviously poses a, a threat to all of the SDGs, but the OECD now lists 57 uh, countries which are listed as a, as a fragile context. They're home to around a fifth, uh, nearly a quarter of the world's population, 1.8 billion people, um, and more than three quarters of those who are living in extreme poverty. And you can see from this, this chart that in all cases, almost all cases, uh, people living in fragile contexts have um, lower levels of service than their counterparts living in non-fragile contexts. That's true across all of the SDG regions. Um, in 2020, for example, people living in fragile contexts were half as likely as those living in non-fragile contexts to have safely managed drinking water and safely managed sanitation services. Um, they're also uh, uh, five times as likely to lack basic drinking water and four times as likely to lack basic sanitation and three times as likely to practice open defecation. So clearly efforts to achieve uh, these global targets will need to be concentrated in those countries and those contexts uh, which are most off track. And there are some particular challenges um, in these settings, uh, which will clearly be very hard um, to address, uh, but need to be a major focus of, of efforts to accelerate progress between now and 2030. Now I'm gonna continue um, and start the discussion on drinking water. Uh, and then we'll break uh, for a, um, a plenary discussion and a, and a Q and A um, after that. So target 6.1 is about drinking water services and the JMP uses service ladders to benchmark and compare progress across countries. These have been updated for um, the purposes of SDG monitoring. And we now have uh, five service levels. We still track uh, the population using surface water and those who are using unimproved sources, such as drinking water from an unprotected well or an unprotected spring. But for the SDG period, the population using improved sources are now divided into three categories. So if it's an improved source where collection time exceeds 30 minutes, we call that a limited service. If it's an improved source, um, where collection takes no more than 30 minutes, that counts as a basic service. But to meet the SDG standard, which is a safely managed service, um, improved sources uh, need to meet three additional criteria. The first is they should be accessible on premises. Secondly, the water should be available when needed. And thirdly, the water should be free from contamination. So fecal contamination in all contexts, 
and in some contexts also priority chemicals. So for global monitoring, that means arsenic and fluoride. And we sometimes combine these top two categories, basic and safely managed, um, and use the category at least basic, uh, which is the indicator that's used for monitoring SDG target 1.4 on universal access to basic services. Now the headline finding um, is unsurprisingly, the world is not on track to achieve universal access to safely managed drinking water services by 2030. You can see here since 2015, coverage of safely managed drinking water has increased from 70% to 74%, just four percentage points. And at current rates of progress, um, coverage globally will be around 81% in 2030. So that would leave 1.6 billion people without safely managed drinking water services. Different regions are progressing at different rates. Central and Southern Asia has achieved the fastest rate of progress, um, but none of these SDG regions is currently on track to achieve universal coverage by, by 2030. Europe and North America uh, will reach around 98% of current rates of progress continue. And then uh, although Sub-Saharan Africa has uh, recorded the second fastest rate of progress, because uh, the starting point uh, coverage was, was much, much lower, um, just 27% in 2015 and 30% in 2020. That means that the current rates of progress um, will only reach around 37% coverage by 2030. Next slide, please. So we present these ladders which show trends between 2015 and, for, and 2020 uh, for the SDG regions. Uh, on the left hand side and also for the world on the right hand side. Um, we can see that uh, estimates are available uh, for safely managed services for five out of the eight SDG regions, um, but coverage uh, ranges very widely from 30% in Sub-Saharan Africa to 96% in Europe and Northern America. And what we can see is that uh, there are also very large numbers of people who still lack even basic services. Um, 771 million people globally uh, lacking a basic drinking water service in 2020. Eight out of 10 of those living in rural areas and nearly half of them living in least developed countries. Now in 2020, we had estimates available for 138 countries, um, which is a big improvement on the last update. Uh, but because we're still lacking data for some of the biggest countries in the world, such as India and China, um, then the data we have only cover around 45% of the global population. And what we see is that uh, these new data that we need for um, monitoring the SDG indicator, data on accessibility, availability, and quality, um, are less widely available um, for low and middle income countries, more likely to be available for upper middle and high income countries. Now, increasingly, we're able to estimate trends. And this chart is showing uh, coverage along the horizontal axis and annual rates of change on the vertical axis. So if your coverage is higher then the rate of change required in order to get to universal by 2030 will be less. If your coverage is lower, you need a higher rate of progress. And we can plot them on this chart and those shown in blue are those that are currently on track, uh, assuming current rates of progress continue to achieve universal safely managed drinking water services by 2030. Only 16 out of the 99 countries for which we had trend data and had not already achieved universal coverage uh, were on track. And the majority, I think 69 countries there, are progressing too slowly. And, and those are shown in the yellow zone and there are 14 countries in the orange zone where coverage is actually decreasing. So the Republic of Moldova is shown there, highlighted, um, recorded the fastest rate of change uh, since 2000, 1.68 percentage points per year, but that's still not gonna be sufficient to get to universal coverage by 2030. The next slide is showing that there's a huge variation uh, when it comes to service levels. Um, so we're looking at uh, data on accessibility on premises. That's the dark blue dots. Availability when needed. That's the medium blue dots. 
and free from contamination. That's the light blue dots. And you can see within each region of the world, there's a huge spread. Um, so for example, in Latin America and the Caribbean, accessibility on premises is ranging from about 8% in Haiti uh, to universal um, in around eight countries. Uh, and availability when needed is ranging from, from just 26% in Bolivia uh, to universal in, in Chile, Puerto Rico and, and Uruguay. Um, only about 43% of the population in Mexico is drinking water free from contamination, compared with nearly 100% in Puerto Rico um, and Martinique. So very big differences uh, between the regions, but also within the regions and between the different countries that make up those regions. We also increasingly have data which can be disaggregated at subnational levels. Um, so where we have data collected through a household survey, we're not only able to um, show differences uh, between um, urban and rural, but also by wealth quintile and by subnational region. So this chart is showing data from a multi-indicator cluster survey in Chad, um, which allows us to disaggregate information on accessibility, availability, and quality uh, by wealth quintile and by subnational region. And although you can see that the, the differences um, uh, between the richest and the poorest for availability and quality were not very large. The differences for accessibility on premises are very large indeed. So 42% of the richest had drinking water accessible on premises compared with just 4% of the poorest. Similarly for subnational regions, um, accessibility on premises is, is, is a big challenge in many, in many parts of the country. 69% um, in, in Borku, uh, compared with just 2% uh, in the LAC region. Uh, but you also see uh, quite big differences for availability and also for quality of drinking water. And this kind of uh, disaggregated information is incredibly important uh, when it comes uh, to informing decision-making around policy and programming. Um, we also see quite big differences in terms of uh, exposure risks. So the data that are coming through now from household surveys which include water quality testing, not only tell us uh, the proportion of the population that are drinking water that's free from contamination, but also if the drinking water is contaminated, they can show us uh, how heavily contaminated and how high a risk uh, there is of contamination. Um, so again, these are uh, household surveys that have included uh, water quality testing in a number of countries. Um, and you can see that, uh, you know, large numbers of people in many of these countries are drinking water that is contaminated. And in six of those countries, so if you look, uh, Sierra Leone, Chad, Ethiopia, Kiribati, Laos, and Madagascar, um, it's less than 20% of the population using sources which are free from contamination, shown in blue. And in four of them, um, over 40% using sources with a very high risk of contamination, that's shown in the dark orange. So again, these data are very powerful for understanding uh, not just uh, where the problems are, but also the magnitude of the problem that needs to be addressed and the populations who are most at risk. Uh, the report also uh, tracks progress towards universal basic. Uh, since 2015, um, uh, many countries have, have recorded good progress uh, towards uh, universal basic. Um, you see some, some variations uh, across regions, but also within regions. The countries that have achieved the fastest progress tend, tend to be those with a lower starting point, so um, less than 75% coverage in, in 2015. Um, and those that are already above 90% tend to progress more slowly. Um, but what you can see is that some countries with very similar starting points have fared very differently. So in 2015, I think in Mozambique, about 51% of the population um, had uh, basic services, compared with 42% in Central African Republic. Uh, but since then, coverage in Mozambique has uh, increased uh, dramatically, uh, about 12 percentage points, whereas in Central African Republic, it's actually decreased by five percentage points. If we look at inequalities in uh, coverage of basic drinking water services, uh, we can also see um, some quite marked differences, especially between the richest and the poorest. So this chart is showing the ratio of coverage amongst the richest to the poorest. And this is a useful indicator of, of inequality. 
So for example, in rural Somalia, coverage amongst the richest is 3.9 times higher than it is amongst the poorest. And in urban Madagascar, coverage among the richest is 4.9 times higher than it is amongst the poorest. And this just shows that there are very big differences still um, um, between the richest and the poorest within these countries uh, and within urban and within rural populations, uh, which will need to be reduced in order to achieve the target of universal access for all. Last slide on drinking water is showing uh, where the population are who still lack even a basic drinking water service. So between 2000 and 2020, there's been a fairly dramatic reduction in the global population lacking basic drinking water services. It's been reduced by, by a third from over 1.2 billion down to 771 million. The number of people without basic services has decreased in, in all of these regions, with the exception of Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, Eastern and Southeastern Asia, I think, has recorded the biggest reduction, a two-thirds reduction. But in Sub-Saharan Africa, the population without basic services has actually increased slightly from 350 million to 387 million. So what this means is that uh, Sub-Saharan Africa now accounts for around half of the global population without basic drinking water services in 2020. Um, eight out of 10 of those um, in Sub-Saharan Africa um, who lack basic drinking water services actually live in, in rural, um, and nearly half um, are living in, in least developed countries. So this is highlighting the, the work that remains to be done, even to achieve universal access to at least a basic level of service by 2030. So that was my last slide. I'm now going to turn back to Rick uh, to uh, facilitate the Q&A. Thank you, Tom. We now have a period uh, for discussion and questions and answers. I encourage you to, to write some questions you might have into the chat, or you can raise your hand in the attendee list um, and we can call on you and unmute you if you want to make your, your comment um, spoken. Uh, please note that we do have the translation channel so you're able to, to communicate in uh, French or Spanish if you prefer. We also have two colleagues from WHO and UNICEF regional offices on the line. And I'd like to ask my colleague from uh, PAHO in Peru, Patricia Seguraro, to start the discussion with some reflections on the progress that's been made towards national monitoring of the SDG indicators in the Latin American and Caribbean region. And Patricia, you can go ahead and start. And I, I'm just going to pull up the slides that you shared with me earlier. But please go ahead um, and share your thoughts. Gracias, Rick. Muchas gracias, Rick. Y bueno, gracias por la oportunidad. Y creo que nos han ha dado una radiografía de, de cómo está el mundo y cómo están nuestras regiones. En estos últimos seis años hemos tenido que hacer eh, todo un cambio desde la mirada de, de los ODM y desde los, a llegar a los ODS. Y ese cambio implica también una, una, una mirada y una cómo está nuestra situación de información en, nuestra, en la región. Casi todos los sistemas están uh, enfocados a medir cobertura de acceso porque era el indicador que, que, que se estaba monitoreando. Ahora tenemos que ver otra mirada diferente, pensar en, en, no solo en acceso, sino que en la calidad, en la continuidad de los servicios, en la equidad. Y eso ha planteado a, en tener que revisar y tener que trabajar en capacitar, en dar a conocer cuáles son las, a, estas nuevas metas, interiorizar a cada uno de los países. Hemos trabajado en, en buscar cursos uh, uh, virtuales para, este, uh, para llegar a, esta, esta, a este tópico, pensar en construir eh, protocolos para el tema de establecimientos de salud, protocolos de, de que nos permitan recolectar información de los establecimientos de salud también. Y, y, y viendo esto, pues el registro de información es importante, 
los países eh, tienen que ver cómo eh, interoperan esta, esta información. No está en, un solo, en, un solo, en una sola área. Podemos ver cómo los reguladores tienen información, los que tienen, hacen la vigilancia tienen información, los, eh, los que planifican. Entonces, ¿Cómo eh, a trabajar, además de, de las estadísticas, fortalecer los sistemas de información en los países es clave? que puedan monitorear sus, su, su, sus metas, y no solo a nivel, a nivel nas, eh, nacional, sino que a, a nivel de los territorios, a nivel subnacional. De esta forma podemos hacer una, una, una mejor planificación. ¿Cómo usamos esta información para los procesos de planificación en, en nuestros países? Creo que eso es, esa, eso es clave. O sea, tener la información es tenerla para una acción que nos permita una mejor planificación y que podamos eh, re mover recursos. Muchas veces tenemos información más a nivel de global, a nivel urbano, y se nos queda visible en los niveles rurales. Ese es una, un, un punto importante, porque estamos haciendo un proceso de exclusión. Vemos el tema de calidad del agua y... Y en el tema de calidad del agua, no solo es falta de información, también es priorizar ese componente en, en todo el proceso de, de planificación. Y en, en el uso de, de incluso en este, en este tema de calidad, la población tiene que tener, saber que cuando abre sus grifos, el agua es de calidad. Y estamos moviendo a usos de agua más embotellada, que estar usando agua de grifo. Y hace años se tomaba agua, agua de grifo. Tenemos que pensar en, en esos cambios que pueden ser diferentes hacia, la, hacia, hacia, hacia nuestra población. Y en este sentido quisiera ver algunos desafíos. Uh, tal vez pasas a la siguiente, Rit, por favor. ¿O yo la tengo? Rit, yo tengo la, 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 la ponencia o tú puedes pasar a la siguiente. You should be seeing the second slide now. Um, uh, please. There's a fields. Uh, estoy viendo la primera. I can see um, the first. Are other people seeing the second one or the first one? It's the first one. Oh, heavens. Um, on my screen, it's definitely the second one. <laughs> Don't worry. Um, Maybe try to uh, stop sharing and share again. Yes, I'll do that. Thank you. Let's see. And I'll share again. The second one right now. Is the Gracias. second one now? Okay, good. Okay. Bueno, creo que en parte del en el tema de, de información tenemos que avanzar en contar con ver esta brecha de información, qué nos hace falta de información, pero información de los países que construyan para que les tomen las decisiones. Y después tenemos que avanzar en cómo esta información se va y se alinea a los procesos de planificación. Cómo están nuestros planes nacionales y subnacionales ya con metas ODS, ya con metas que nos permitan hacer ese cambio. Y luego tenemos que considerar la, la capacitación en los recursos humanos. Creo que ese es, ese es un punto continuo que tenemos que ir eh, viéndolo a todo nivel, o sea, a nivel nacional y subnacional, para fortalecer estos componentes. Hemos hecho también eh, un análisis y estamos en el proceso de recolección, cómo están nuestros laboratorios. ¿Cuál es la situación de los laboratorios? Estamos, vamos a hacer en, en nuestro curso de este mes un inventario de la situación de los laboratorios para saber, bueno, estas son nuestras capacidades. ¿Cómo podemos mejorar estas capacidades que nos permitan un mejor monitoreo de la calidad del agua y podamos eh, eh, realmente uh, tener una mejor gestión en ese aspecto? Estamos trabajando también en, en, en buscar 
eh, un entrenamiento y hemos estado haciendo entrenamiento para el desarrollo de planes de seguridad del agua y planes de seguridad de saneamiento. Estamos tratando de que sea integral, que lo vean en forma integral el agua y el saneamiento, porque al final eh, tenemos todo un ciclo y en ese ciclo tenemos que buscar las opciones en el territorio, porque eso es importante en el territorio, que puedan mejorar la calidad del agua y mejorar la protección de los, de los recursos en, en, en el territorio. ¿Qué, qué, es, ¿Qué buscamos después de, de todo esto? Tener información no basta, tenemos que construir políticas públicas alrededor de esta información, tenemos que construir también, asegurar que nadie se nos quede atrás, en especial cuáles son los que están en las zonas rurales, como mencionaba a Toma, en las zonas rurales, y, y en estas tenemos nuestros pueblos originarios. Entonces, ¿cómo llegar a ellos? ¿Cuál estrategia tenemos que llegar? Y cómo en, a, en medio de este eh, sector, que todo, hay mucho, muchos que trabajan en el sector y, y hemos visto en los, en los grupos intersectoriales que hemos tratado de con, ir conformando, como uh, la necesidad de, de unir esfuerzos a nivel de los países, conformar unas a, acciones intersectoriales para mover la agenda. Si no, vamos a, eh, si no tenemos una, una sola mirada, va a ser muy difícil llegar a esta meta. De, estamos viendo que necesitamos mayor, mayor, uh, una aceler, acelerar, acelerar estos, estas metas y entonces... Eh, esto es uno de los puntos importantes para que podamos desarrollarnos, trabajar en esta realidad de una promoción donde construyamos políticas públicas, donde trabajemos alrededor de la educación de la comunidad, donde participe la comunidad en todo este, en todo este proceso y hacer uso de la, de la información va a ser clave para nosotros. Creo que son unas reflexiones que nos, que nos pidió Rick Uh, para este, a, este, a este componente, pero hagamos uso de la información. Venimos trabajando con las diferentes redes. Creo que en Centroamérica está el FOCAR y uh, hay, hay mecanismos subregionales que podemos utilizar y que podemos realmente hacer el cambio si todos ponemos un poquito de esfuerzo. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Patricia. And that's a great message to, to end on. Um, I think I really like the examples you gave of intersectoral coordination and the need to build capacity development for data collection, but most of all that, that the data are collected are used uh, to inform local planning and, and, and um, investments. And sometimes it's difficult to collect data that can give the level of detail that's necessary for local planning, as well as being able to produce globally um, you know, useful uh, data for the SDGs. I see that we have a question in the Q&A about what the top three difficulties um, we find are in collecting information from countries and governments. I'll ask uh, Patricia, uh, Tom, any of our other panelists to answer that one in writing, because I think we need to move on to sanitation and hygiene. There have also been several questions in the chat about uh, getting to the sanitation and hygiene. So it's nice to see a lot of interest in those topics. Then if we turn then to target 6.2, there are two indicators, one on sanitation and hygiene. Uh, for sanitation, we have the same type of ladder that Tom presented for the uh, drinking water services. And that starts with the, the lowest level of service, people who really have no services at all on the bottom, who practice open defecation, We've monitored that throughout the MDG period, and we continue to do that in the SDGs. And then those who use some kind of pit latrine without sanitary protection, like a slab or platform, are classed as having unimproved services. Then among those who have improved facilities, uh, we break those groups into three different classes or categories, depending on the level of service. So if those improved facilities are shared with other households, We call that a limited service because there are limitations possibly about when um, you know, people can safely access at all times and also about some of the public health risks where you do see um, uh, disease rates being higher among people using limited or shared facilities. But then if they're not shared, that counts as a basic service level, 
or uh, if it meets the additional criteria of the SDGs about excreta management, then it would count as safely managed. And just, for drink, just as for drinking water, sometimes we group safely managed and basic services together uh, as at least basic services, which is used to track um, uh, target 1.4 under the poverty goal. But to reach safely managed then, it's not enough to have uh, an improved facility that's not shared, but we need to know that the excreta deposited in that facility are either safely treated and disposed of on site or are removed and treated off site. So that's the new level of ambition in the SDGs. So if we look at the new report, we show that uh, many countries still don't have sufficient national data to report on the SDG global indicator. You see some countries are still in gray here. So in 2020, we did have national estimates for 120 countries, areas, and territories. And those represent over 80% of the global population because we do have data from India and China. One interesting thing to find uh, is that in 2020, more people now use on-site sanitation facilities, such as septic tanks and latrines, than have sewer connections. But while most countries do have data on the treatment of wastewater from households connected to sewers, very few countries have the data on treatment and disposal of waste from septic tanks and pit latrines. So that's uh, one of the big data gaps we have going forward. On the right here, you can see that safely managed sanitation services did increase from 47% in 2015 to 54% in 2020, but that still means that uh, almost half, 46% of the global population still lack safely managed um, sanitation services. And about 20%, 21% still lacked even basic services. So there's definitely a room for uh, further progress. We do have um, SDG estimates for seven out of the eight SDG regions. And you can see on the left that there have been different levels, but also rates of progress. Where on the left, you see the regions with lower coverage. And on the right, the regions with higher coverage. Some of the regions that have seen the most rapid growth are Central and Southern Asia and Eastern and Southeastern Asia, where you can see the, the lines are sloping up steeply. We can see this again in this graph that looks at the progress between 2015 and 2020, but extrapolates it all the way to 2030. And here we can see that if current rates of progress continued, the world would only reach about 67% safely managed sanitation by 2030 at the end of the SDGs. So that would be one, one in three people still not having safety managed services. And if we look at the other regions, in fact, you can see that none of the SDG regions are on track to achieve universal access to safety managed sanitation by 2030. Even the, the high income countries, Australia and New Zealand, Europe and North America, um, the rates of progress have been quite slow. And some of this is due to the lack of data about um, non sewered sanitation. Even in high income countries, there will always be some proportion of the population, 10, 20% perhaps, who use septic tanks or, or other on site systems. And without data on how well those wastes are managed, we can't say anything about um, if they're safely managed or not. If we turn from regions to look at individual countries, and again, these graphs show the, the coverage level in 2020 on the horizontal line, and then the historical rate of progress on the vertical axis there, you can see that um, a number of countries have achieved rapid progress, more than two percentage points a year. Um, Lesotho, Slovenia, uh, and China have some of the fastest rates of progress. But because the, the baseline level was, was lower, they have further to go and aren't on track to reach universal coverage by 2030. In fact, only eight of the 109 countries that we have data for are on track for universal coverage by 2030. Progress is too slow in 81 countries, and in 20 countries, coverage is actually declining. Um, as I mentioned, one of the interesting findings of this report is that in 2020, for the first time, more people used improved on-site sanitation facilities than sewer sanitation. Um, and that's because the growth in on-site sanitation 
has been faster than the growth in sewer connections. And that's true in urban and in rural areas. Of course, the distribution varies widely by region and by urban and rural uh, location. At the global level, it's actually quite even. About 43% of the population uses on-site sanitation that's improved, and another 43% uses sewer um, uh, sanitation. But of course, in urban areas, you see the dark green bars are bigger, there's more sewer coverage, but still important fractions of the population with on-site, even in urban. Whereas in rural, uh, the majority of the populations uh, are using on-site sanitation facilities. And then if we look at the different regions, we see that the, um, the least developed countries, the um, uh, fragile contexts, Sub-Saharan Africa, Oceania, Central and Southern Asia, the majority of the population are using on-site sanitation, both in urban and rural settings. Uh, but even in those high income settings in Europe, North America, Australia, and New Zealand, there are significant populations using um, on-site sanitation. We are seeing new sources of data coming though, um, including questions in household surveys about how and when on-site sanitation storage uh, tanks are emptied. And what we see on the left here, first of all, is that a lot of those are never emptied. This graph shows both um, septic tanks in dark green circles and improved pit latrines uh, in, in the green squares. And we're showing urban on the x-axis and rural on the y-axis. So you can see that there's a lot of on-site sanitation, both septic tank and latrines, that's never empty, especially in rural areas. Um, Niger, Gambia, and Mongolia, for instance, have very high populations using septic tanks in rural areas that are reportedly never emptied. Um, there are a few countries, China, Belarus, where emptying is much more common though. And if we look on the right, we can see that especially in urban areas, um, it's more likely that those wastes that are emptied will be removed offsite and taken to some kind of treatment facility. Um, so again, Mongolia, China, Belarus have very high rates of emptying and removal of waste offsite in urban areas. Most of them don't have such high rates uh, in rural areas. Belarus is something of, a, of an exception there. And if uh, wastes are removed from the household and taken to centralized treatment, either through sewer lines or through pit latrines and septic tanks that are, that are emptied and taken to treatment, we see that the centralized wastewater treatment, um, the level of treatment that's available varies widely by region and within region. Now, to be considered safely managed, uh, wastewater needs to go through at least secondary treatment. So that's a biochemical treatment, biological treatment, tertiary treatment, of course, or higher levels would also count. But if it's only primary treatment, physical separating solids of solids, that doesn't count for the safety managed service indicator. So you can see that in each of the SDG regions, there are some countries where less than half of wastewater receives secondary level treatment or higher, even in Eastern and Southeastern Asia, which has the highest regional average. And then of course, in Latin America and Caribbean, Central and Southern Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, um, there's quite a lot of wastewater that doesn't receive that level of treatment. If we look uh, at the basic sanitation indicator, that's using an improved sanitation facility that's not shared. Uh, we do see uh, a big decrease in the number of people over time who, who do use, who lack basic sanitation services. And in all of the SDG regions, except for Sub-Saharan Africa and Oceania, that number has decreased. If you look at Central and Southern Asia, um, there's been a very large drop from uh, 1155 down to 578 um, million people, an even larger proportional drop in Latin America and Caribbean. And one of the challenges in Sub-Saharan Africa is that the population growth is, is much faster there and services are being added, but they're just not able to keep up with that um, driving, uh, that driver of population growth and urbanization. Then there are those who don't even have um, unimproved or, or limited services. And in five countries, still more than 5% of the population practiced open defecation in 2020. A lot of them are concentrated in sub-Saharan Africa, but there are still significant populations 
throughout Asia and in some countries of, of Latin America. And if we look at those um, disaggregated data that are available from household surveys, we can see some really large inequalities, both within regions. Here you can see that in Sub-Saharan Africa, there's a really great spread between countries about open defecation. It's, it's basically eliminated in some countries, but in other countries, it's over 60%. If we zoom in on Madagascar, where 42% of the population still practices open defecation, we see a big gap between rural and urban areas, but a, a larger gap between the poorest quintile, the poorest 20% at 67%, uh, compared to only 5% of the richest quintile. But if we look at the most uh, disaggregated measure we have, the subnational regions, we can see that in Analamanga, where the capital is located, only about 5% of the population practices open defecation compared to 85% in Iho Rombe. So um, these, these data can really reveal some, some stark inequalities that again, could be used to help um, design programs and target those being left behind. All right, that's my last slide. So I'd like to turn now to open discussion um, about sanitation and turn it over to Tom to facilitate some of the questions that have come in. Okay, thanks, Rick. Um, and we've already got some, some good questions um, on, on sanitation, um, which I'll, I'll ask you to, to have a look at and, re and respond to. Um, but I'd also like to turn and ask um, Farai maybe to kick off the discussion uh, on this question of, you know, what sort of progress have we made at a country level in terms of monitoring these, these targets? Um, and what is, you know, still to do in terms of strengthening monitoring and sanitation systems? Um, Farai, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Tom, uh, for that question. I think it's, it's one that here in Eastern and Southern Africa, we have really been uh, grappling with. In 2020, we did an analysis of the 21 countries in Eastern and Southern Africa, and we wanted to see how far we had gone uh, within the five years of SDG implementation. And what we found was that within our region, which had 21 countries, we had a total of 22 monitoring systems in five countries. And we saw a mix of monitoring between urban and rural, and only 40% of those covered water, sanitation, and hygiene. And the good news is at least 50% of those covered sanitation. So at least there is some progress in terms of um, sanitation monitoring. We also found that none of our countries were on track to achieve um, SDG 6, um, save for Botswana, uh, who will achieve uh, universal access to basic sanitation services by 2030. The others are really tracking um, with, uh, with a huge chunk uh, achieving the target by 2050 and others way beyond um, the 2050 target. So um, we still see a lot of our countries are working with the MDG data. Uh, and it's quite a challenge to really get them to transition to the SDG uh, type um, data. There is still a lot of issues around data collection in terms of frequency and comprehensiveness. And again, really strengthening our routine monitoring systems becomes very, very important. And we have also seen um, a lot of gaps with in terms of monitoring data with a lot of the monitoring data really coming out uh, from the JMP data. So most of our countries are still reporting at a basic service level and they really rely on JMP for the more complete data um, and really an attempt to cover the higher levels of service um, um, and, and, and really filling in those gaps that routine monitoring would provide us. In this region, again, out of these 21 countries, we saw 12 countries have um, some routine monitoring system for sanitation, but only five of those 12 can actually report to the limited um, level or limited service level 
We still see a lot of gaps around the fecal sludge management and really understanding all those different um, aspects of uh, fecal sludge management and, uh, <clears throat> and reaching the, the, um, the, the JMP levels as well as the requirements of uh, the SDGs. So what is it that we can do? We came up with a number of recommendations and really when you understand the monitoring systems, it's, they really lead us to how far we can go with the SDGs because we can't achieve what we cannot measure. So it's really important for us to measure. So in terms of our recommendations, we've really looked at an array of recommendations uh, for, for financing partners, for governments, as well as uh, institutions such as UNICEF and others, um, and other, uh, others around us. Uh, for example, uh, for the financing partners, it's really about finding funding and, and, and financing to bridge the infrastructure gap that is needed for us to achieve the SDGs, not only for the infrastructure itself, but also for the monitoring systems that allow us to see how far we have come. We need to really strengthen the case for data because without understanding what we are working towards, um, we will not be able to achieve the SDGs. And when it comes to data, it's not only about the quality of data, but it's also about its availability. We also need to see a greater integration between health, education, and WASH, because we have really seen our health monitoring information systems and education monitoring information systems are sometimes even doing better in terms of capturing the sanitation data. In terms of um, recommendations for governments, there's really a lot of work that has been done in terms of putting up these monitoring systems, but some of them need to be adjusted to capture the JMP indicators. We also need to explore new and innovative ways of collecting data, particularly for hygiene facilities, uh, because these are very much at a household level. Uh, and a lot of our data also needs to be collected there and really um, strength, strengthening our, our routine monitoring systems in that area. And of course, how can we expand already existing health MIS uh, systems so that they incorporate a lot of the JMP WASH uh, indicators and, and really collect the data um, that, that we need? Where routine monitoring systems don't exist, we have also been able to identify countries such as South Africa, such as Tanzania, that are really doing well in terms of capturing this information and really providing platforms where through MCOW uh, and the governments themselves, we are able to share uh, some of this good practice that is also coming out. We also see quite a, a, um, a separation between data that is collected using other uh, government systems and the water utilities. And um, water utilities, once integrated into the national monitoring systems, could also provide um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of value. In terms of institutional improvements as well, we should also look at how we can make data open and available and really integrate it into our planning, into our implementation, into our, our progress monitoring. We also need to look at what needs to be done, particularly around the enabling environment to strengthen the use of data at national as well as at, at, at uh, sub-national systems. And of course, really having um, systems that allow us to integrate health, education, and WASH so that we have a wholesome monitoring information systems for WASH. Um, over back to you, um, Tom. I hope I've covered uh, quite a bit of the aspects. Wonderful. Thanks, uh, Farai. And it sounds like a really interesting initiative, uh, the SDG Plus 5 initiative. It's led to a very focused discussion on not just uh, targets, but the data that is available in order to track the targets, this transition from MDG to SDG monitoring, but also moving away from a one-off data collection towards a more routine collection of data that can inform decision-making on, on the ground. So lots of 
lots of really good points. And you also highlighted uh, this, this big challenge around uh, fecal sludge management, uh, where there are very little data, which is something that, that Rick mentioned, especially important in, in sub-Saharan Africa, where that's the dominant uh, type of sanitation that people are using. Uh, Rick, we just have three questions that I'd like you to answer before you move to hygiene. One is, um, uh, what happens to the never emptied uh, latrines uh, when they're overflowing? One is on climate change. And the third one is how we're using data from regulators for 6.1, 6.2 and 6.3. Could you take those three? Sure, and I saw that there were actually a few questions related around this question of emptying. Um, so I think uh, Ananda Jayawira um, had a question about, well, if people are never emptying their, their on-site storage, what do they do when it overflows? And it relates to Shiva Singh's comment that at least in some rural sub-Saharan Africa contexts, um, typically um, facilities are closed and, and um, you know, when they fill up, people just bury them and build a, a new pit, something like that. So um, shouldn't we take basic sanitation as a proxy for safely managed sanitation services in those areas? And it is very interesting to see the new data that's available now from household surveys where people report their emptying practices. And you saw, I shared some of the information showing that uh, in many cases, people say that their systems have never been emptied. And that might be because when it empties, they, when it becomes full, they cover it and they build a new one. And in fact, that should count as safely managed sanitation. But we also see cases where um, things have never been emptied because they are um, not designed and operated in a hygienic way. We, we uh, see examples of septic tanks or so-called septic tanks, especially in urban areas that are really more like cesspits uh, that have an effluent line uh, leading out to an open drain. So if you, if you basically have that kind of dysfunctional on-site system, um, that may never need to be emptied because the solids just continually pass through. So of course that shouldn't count as safely managed sanitation. And what we see then is a challenge to define, well, which of these on-site systems are actually containing and treating waste properly and should count as safely managed sanitation and which aren't. So we've been working with a number of pilot countries on something called the Safely Managed On-Site Sanitation Project to develop tools and methods to measure just that. And they have found that in many cases, um, improved sanitation facilities are not, um, should not be counted as safely managed services, even if they are reportedly not yet emptied. So I think that's a, that's a work in progress. Um, the second question about, I'm going to take the one about regulators too, because um, it's also somehow related to the question for uh, a request for best practices around wastewater monitoring. Um, we do make use of administrative types of data, uh, as well as data from household surveys, and especially from sanitation, you know, households can't say anything about what happens to the waste once it leaves their properties, whether it's flushed down a toilet into a sewer line, or if it's taken off premises in a desludging truck, we have to have information from the sector about that. And again, that's a, one of the big data challenges that we're working on with the, the SMOS project. But some of the examples of good data come from countries that have uh, uh, strong regulatory authorities, um, many of them in high income countries, but there are good examples from, from, from Kenya, from Zambia of regulators who uh, oversee services, both of drinking water and sanitation and wastewater providers. So I would point to those as examples of, uh, of how administrative data on wastewater treatment could be collected and compiled um, to feed into SDG reporting. Those regulators know so much more about the, the quality of the treatment that's happening. They have relationships with the service providers. So it's really ideal if they can do that work of determining what is, what is um, reaching treatment, what kind of level of treatment is being delivered. And then we can um, uh, skim, skim some of that information for SDG reporting. Then the final one about um, how climate change is affecting this. I, I think we, we hear anecdotally that climate change is having real impacts on water and sanitation services that people are facing. 
There's um, certainly more flooding in some countries. There's also uh, more extreme weather events, which can lead to sanitation or water facilities being damaged, including household systems, but also including large municipal systems. So I think you do see a trend towards um, climate resilient water safety planning and sanitation safety planning. But um, I think that's more at the level of how to how to mitigate uh, climate change than actually tracking or quantifying how much climate change has contributed to differences in sanitation uh, coverage yet. So with that, um, if there are further comments that people have, keep writing them into the chat, but I'm gonna continue on then to talk about hygiene. If I can find the slide, yes. So the second part of SDG indicate a target 6.2 is about hygiene. Uh, and we were all very happy to have this included in the SDGs because it was completely absent in the MDG period. And um, what was chosen as the global indicator for, for hygiene then is called basic hygiene services. And that's having a hand-washing facility with soap and water available at home. Um, most of the data for this come from household surveys, where for over 10 years now, um, the major survey programs have been asking their survey teams not to ask people in the household if they wash their hands, we know that doesn't give good data, but to ask, can I see the place where you wash hands after defecation, and then to record, well, is there soap there, is there water there, so that's a more robust type of indicator. And then sometimes there is a hand washing facility but it's lacking either soap or water in the home. We call that a limited hygiene service. Then of course, at the bottom of the ladder, there are those who have no hand washing facility at all at home. So in the 2021 report, we had 79 countries with estimates for basic hygiene services, just a little bit over 50% of the global population. But the map makes it clear that uh, these data are, are really lacking in the high income countries because they don't have as many household surveys. And when they do, they typically don't ask about water, sanitation, or hygiene because they presume universal coverage. Um, there are many countries in Sub-Saharan Africa and Asia though, um, and, and some also in Latin America and the Caribbean that do collect this kind of information. You can see uh, from the colors on the map that it's in Sub-Saharan Africa where we tend to see the, the lower rates uh, of coverage. Now, out of the eight SDG regions, we have estimates only for four of the regions um, shown on the left there. And on the right, you can see at the global level, we've seen progress moving from 67% of households or a population having basic hygiene in 2015 to 71% in 2020. But the, there's a lot of uh, disparity globally. You can see in Sub-Saharan Africa and Oceania, the coverage levels are quite low. And in fact, in both of those regions, about a third of the population has no hand washing facility all, at all at home. On the other hand, if you look at Northern Africa and Western Asia, the progress has been quite rapid, up to 91% in 2020. And in fact, this is um, uh, one of the only regions that's on track to reach the SDG target by 2030. We also see uh, that coverage tends to be higher in urban than in rural areas, but many regions still lack data. And sometimes they'll have data only for rural or only for urban areas. Um, you see on the bottom in this slide, the urban settings have more gray bars, uh, including at the global level. And that's because um, there are some surveys that collect data only in rural areas. So we have enough data coverage at the global level um, in Northern Africa and Western Asia, in Latin America and the Caribbean to say something about rural areas, but not about urban areas. And then if we extrapolate forward to 2030, we see at the global level, the world would only reach 78% uh, basic hygiene services by 2030. And I mentioned Northern Africa and Western Asia would actually be on track to reach universal coverage before 2030, but it's really Oceania and Sub-Saharan Africa where both the coverage levels are the lowest and the rates of progress lowest. So the multiplier would have to be really, really large in order to, um, to meet the target by 2030. 
The surveys um, that we draw on go into more detail too, sometimes about the type of hand washing facilities that are used. And one thing that's become clear is that in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, many people use mobile devices for hand washing. That's shown in the light purple bars on the left of this chart. And in many countries, more people are using mobile devices than fixed devices that you see on the right side. Uh, however, some of the older surveys didn't ask uh, separately about mobile devices or fixed devices. And we, we have reason to believe that in some of those older surveys, <clears throat> um, sur uh, the enumerators were looking for fixed devices. So if there were mobile devices, they might not have been captured. So we suspect that, for instance, in Liberia, in Rwanda, where you can see there's no bar on the left, if we did have a, a new survey that would collect information on mobile devices, we might see that more of the population actually does have a hand washing facility in the home than, than we had from those earlier surveys. Another thing to look at is among those who do have hand washing facilities in the home, how many of them have water and soap or water only or soap only or lack both? Here, the purple bars are, are those with both water and soap among people with hand washing facilities. And the dark orange are those, those who lack both water and soap. So in some countries, you know, many people have, have neither water nor soap. But you can see that the light yellow bars um, tend to be bigger than the light orange bars. And the light yellow are those who have water but don't have soap. And the, the light orange are those who, soap, who have soap but don't have water. And it's, it's um, every country is different, but it's relatively uncommon for households to have a hand washing facility and soap, but to lack water. So in most cases, we find that um, either both are missing or soap is missing. And that, that could be the limiting factor preventing people from having basic hygiene services. This next chart compares um, access to drinking water on premises on the horizontal axis compared to basic hygiene services on the right. And again, you see that there are more points below the, the line. So those are more households that do have drinking water on premises, but not everyone has um, basic hygiene services, meaning that soap is the missing factor here. So Bolivia in particular stands out with over 80% of the population with water on premises, but only about 20, 25% having basic hygiene. On the other hand, in Mongolia, um, basic hygiene is over 80%, but only about 30% of people have uh, drinking water supplies on premises. So in Mongolia, people are collecting water from outside the home, they're bringing it in the home, but it's, it's usually available for hand washing along with soap. If we look at the differences between the wealthiest uh, and the poorest, we see very large inequalities here for, for basic hygiene. If you look at, at the top in rural areas in Iswatini, the richest 20% are 11 times more likely to have basic hygiene than the poorest uh, 20%. In urban areas, it's even higher. It's 32 times higher in Liberia for the urban rich compared to the urban poor the urban richest 20%, I should say. And where we see these really huge ratios like that, it tends to be because the, the poorest quintile, the poorest 20% have very, very low coverage, um, 1%, 2%, less than that even. So, um, so in many of these countries, then the inequalities about having access to the basic materials for, for hand washing are really extreme. Uh, we can also look at those households that have no hand washing facility at all, not even a limited service. And we find that in 28 countries, at least one in four people had no hand washing facility at home in 2020. And in, in the case of Rwanda, it was up to 86%, though possibly if we got a better survey in that would count mobile hand washing devices in Rwanda, uh, we might see a different picture there. But especially in the context of COVID and concern about uh, managing infectious disease outbreaks, there's, there's just no way to, um, to maintain a hygienic environment for these populations that don't have access even to hand washing facilities at home. So that's my last slide. I'd like to again open up a discussion now before we move on to the last section on menstrual health to see what kind of progress has been made, especially in the area of 
hygiene and what needs to be done to strengthen national monitoring of the SDG indicators around hygiene. Um, again, the floor is open. If you'd like to make a comment, please raise your hand and we'll unmute you, or you're welcome to, to type something into the chat box. I wonder if while we're waiting for any of the country participants to share their thoughts, if any of our regional colleagues, um, uh, Farai from, from UNICEF East Africa or Patricia from PAHO might want to share any of, um, of your thoughts or experiences around hygiene, monitoring of hygiene in your regions. I see that Francesco from the JMP team here at WHO headquarters um, has something to, to, to say. Francesco, please go ahead. Yes, hi, Rick. Uh, just to fill the space, waiting for some other interventions. Uh, I would like to confirm what you said about uh, uh, monitoring and washing facility water and soap. Uh, very frequently, we have uh, both the elements, so water and soap collected through the household service. Sometimes we have only the existence of a washing facility. Uh, very rarely we have uh, uh, soap and not water, but that happened. It happened uh, in a couple of mixed service, I think, of Eastern Europe. And in that case, uh, we usually assume that if there is water, if there is soap, uh, we assume there is water too. So that question was not included in those household service. Uh, it could happen uh, instead that they, they ask if there is water, but they don't ask if there is soap. Over. Thanks, Francesco, for that. I see in the Q&A, we have a question about whether some of the low results might be because people are, are not willing to show their toilets to the pollsters. Um, Tom, I'm going to ask you if you could take this one because you've been working closely with the MIX team. Uh, UNICEF supports the multiple indicator cluster surveys. And we, we have a lot of information about what people um, will and won't um, agree to uh, from the posters. Yeah, I can speak to this briefly, Rick. And uh, I think it's interesting because um, the, the vast majority of uh, household surveys do not involve a direct observation of facilities. So um, although we have uh, now a standard module on observation of hand washing facilities, most household surveys do not involve an inspection of toilets. Um, now, there are some challenges around asking a household um, whether you can see their toilet and inspect it and make an assessment as to whether or not it has been properly designed or whether it is broken or overflowing. Um, we, we have been um, piloting some, some tools which would enable a very simple inspection to be made, which would determine uh, whether or not the, the toilet is effectively containing waste or whether it is creating a, a hazard because it's overflowing or it's uh, um, discharging directly into the, uh, the, the surface environment of, of the household. Um, but one of the, the important questions is who would do that inspection? Does it need to be somebody uh, who has specialist technical training um, in sanitation facilities, or is it something that could be done as part of a routine uh, survey or could be done by health extension workers who are you know, doing many other assessments in the community? Um, so that's an unresolved issue at the moment, but um, at the moment, uh, the lower results are not a result of households refusing to show toilets because most households don't, aren't actually asked uh, to show their toilets. So the information we're getting is what the household is reporting that they are using, uh, which, which may or may not be uh, completely accurate in all cases. So the important thing uh, 
is to invest in training the enumerators to understand all of the different types of facilities that are most commonly used in that country or in the, in the rural areas or the urban areas to make sure that they are correctly interpreting and classifying uh, the facilities based on the, the answers that the households are giving them. Um, I see Patricia uh, has her hand up and would like to come in maybe on this question or another one. So over to you, Patricia. Un comentario sobre higiene. Yo creo que eh, necesitamos más información sobre este tópico eh, y cómo, cómo colectar eh, información. Y veo, en los, por ejemplo, en los establecimientos de salud, eh, antes de la pandemia, encontramos que sí, habían instalaciones, un 75%, por ejemplo, tenían uh, servicios habilitados de, de, para lavarse las manos con agua pero un 40% no tenía jabón o sea, en, en una instalación. Me imagino que en, en el tema de los hogares eh, surte, como tú dices, Tom, la, la limitación del acceso a las instalaciones. Entonces, copiamos en las encuestas y tuvimos, me acuerdo, hace varios años una, una, un estudio en Paraguay en cuanto a especializado en agua y saneamiento. Y, y ahí se, eh, se identificó uno, capacitar a los encuestadores en, en el tema de agua y saneamiento fue clave para identificar cómo estaban las, las instalaciones, cuál era un pozo que estaba en buenas condiciones y cuál no es un pozo no mejorado. Y creo que eso puede ser importante igual para, para el tema de, de, de saneamiento, ¿no? Cómo están las instalaciones de saneamiento. Pero como te dicen, no siempre el acceso a, de las familias y a, a los encuestadores, y sobre todo cuando hay una situación de violencia, es fácil. Que creo que es un, un componente importante, pero también hay promotores de, de la salud que pueden jugar un rol importante en todo este proceso de identificar cómo está su comunidad y cuáles son las condiciones que tiene la comunidad para poder, en, en agua y saneamiento, nos, nos podría dar una información eh, colectada desde de, de, de la, de, de la mirada de atención primaria. Cambio. Thank you, Patricia. Okay, I see we've got a couple more questions and comments. There's a, a comment from Nigeria about the WASH norm survey that does check progress on access to basic hygiene services. Um, that is a very um, thorough uh, and well-designed survey. So we're, we're very happy to see that kind of survey taking place. I think the hygiene questions were, were initially started by the global programs such as MIX or the demographic and health surveys, but increasingly we're seeing them being adapted uh, and adopted into other nationally led monitoring programs like uh, in Nigeria. There's also a, a question from Mauritius where the surveys don't currently collect uh, information about the availability of hand washing facilities and materials, but there are some questions in household budget surveys about um, expenditures on those. Um, I would say that's, that's interesting and we might be interested in those data in the context of how to measure uh, the affordability of water sanitation hygiene services. Um, which, which is a kind of separate work stream that we have. But as a proxy for basic hand washing services, I think it would be a little bit too far away. Though, especially in high income countries, we still are looking for a proxy that might um, serve to fill some data gaps. But, um, you know, it's also possible to advocate that the household budget survey or some other survey uh, include these basic questions on hand hygiene to fill uh, gaps for the SDGs. I see a comment also that um, hygiene area is also the weakest in MIS systems. Uh, definitely regarding hygiene in households, uh, it tends to be very absent from MIS systems. We do have better um, coverage of, of hygiene in sectoral MIS systems. So for instance, wash in schools, often there will be data in uh, education MIS systems uh, and in some cases, healthcare facilities through HMIS systems collect information about hand hygiene at points of care, uh, less frequently about hand hygiene in toilets, which, which we're also interested in. 
I think we need to move on next to menstrual health. I'm just trying to scan if there were any other outstanding questions, but I think if there are, we'll try and answer those in the chat. So Tom, I think, um, I think you were gonna take us through this new interesting monitoring area, menstrual health, right? Yes, thanks, Rick. And there were a couple of questions, one on shared sanitation um, and one on best practice for monitoring wastewater treatment, which maybe um, we can deal with through the, through the chat. Um, but now we're going to uh, talk briefly about, about menstrual health. Uh, so this is a new topic um, which was featured in our, our last report. Um, yeah, there are many aspects to menstrual health, but uh, clearly um, having access uh, to drinking water, sanitation and hygiene facilities is really uh, particularly important uh, for women and girls uh, during uh, menstruation. Um, but there are a number of other elements to it which are increasingly uh, being addressed through household surveys. Household surveys very often have a separate questionnaire for women and girls aged 15 to 49, and that is an opportunity to ask a, a range of different questions um, on, on other issues. And um, what we've done in our most recent report is to analyse uh, the national data that are now available through these household surveys. And we've grouped them into four areas. So the first is about uh, awareness of menstruation before first period. The second is about the use of, of materials to capture and contain menstrual blood. The third is about access to a private place to wash and change while at home. And the last is about participation. So participation in uh, different activities uh, during menstruation, whether it's school or work or other social activities. And we were able to uh, find data for, for 42 countries um, with, a, with a national data set. Uh, 31 of those had information on at least uh, three of these four indicators. Um, and we found that, uh, you know, generally speaking, uh, these indicators were much more widely available uh, for sub-Saharan Africa than for, than for other regions. Uh, they were more widely available for, for low income uh, than they were for middle income. And there were, there were no countries, no high income countries um, with data on any of these emerging indicators. Um, the indicators themselves are still being developed and refined. Uh, and so they may, they may be adjusted in future, but what we've done is we've analyzed the data that are currently available. Uh, so the next slide um, shows data on awareness of menstruation. And we only had data for two countries, Bangladesh and Egypt were the only countries with national data on this indicator. And here you can see quite big differences at the national level. So in Egypt, 66% uh, of women and girls um, aware of menstruation um, before their first period compared with just 32% in Bangladesh. Um, some quite big differences between urban and rural in Egypt, but almost no difference between rural and urban in Bangladesh. And then it's also possible to disaggregate by, by age um, and also um, age uh, of first period by wealth and, and by disability in the case of Egypt. And you can see you know, important differences by age, um, but really big differences by, by wealth and by disability. So for example, in Egypt, 73% um, um, of the richest compared with just 56% amongst the poorest. 66% um, uh, amongst those with no disability compared with just 45% amongst women and girls with a disability. So you can see quite important inequalities uh, among the population of women and girls um, who uh, reported uh, menstruating in the last 12 months. Turning to uh, use of materials in a private place to wash and change, um, both of these indicators uh, were reportedly quite high uh, in those countries with data available. Uh, so for example, use of, of materials um, range from about 81% up to nearly 100%. Um, similarly, uh, the proportion of women and girls with a private place to wash and change was uh, generally quite high. Uh, you can see in Niger, Tunisia and Burkina Faso, 
52, 56, and 74%, respectively. Um, but the rest range from about 80%, Cote d'Ivoire and Ethiopia, uh, through to nearly 100% in, in some other countries. Um, so you can, you can see that there, there are differences, but uh, generally access and use of materials and a private place to wash and change um, was, was quite high, at least amongst the countries with data. But if you look then at uh, those countries that had a breakdown uh, for rural and for urban, um, we had 12 countries with data. And you can see uh, that at least one in 10 women in rural areas lacked a, a private place uh, to wash and change. Um, and so clearly uh, there are you know, bigger challenges faced by women and girls in, in, in rural areas. Um, in the case of Niger, over half of those uh, living in rural areas lacking a private place to wash and change. Sorry, Rick, can you move the, the slide? Thanks. And in fact, I'll move on to the next one now, which is looking at uh, non-participation uh, during menstruation. Uh, so these are women and girls who reported that they did not participate in school or work or some other social activity during their last period. And we have harmonized data from the UNICEF supported uh, multi-indicator cluster surveys um, for about 28 countries. Uh, we didn't see big differences uh, between urban and rural, um, but we did see some differences uh, by wealth quintile and some quite significant differences uh, by disability. Um, so for example, in Cuba, I think you can see there 32% uh, of women in rural did not participate in one or more of those activities during the last period, compared with um, just 25% uh, in urban areas. Um, in Nepal, uh, women from the poorest households were around four times less likely to participate than women from the richest households. But non-participation doesn't necessarily reflect um, social restrictions or exclusion. Um, it may be a to do with not having resources, um, or it may be to do with women and girls choosing not to participate. So clearly we need to do some more work to further refine these indicators and to separate out the challenges that women and girls are facing. Um, but when it comes to disability, there are quite clear differences. Um, so uh, women with and without uh, functional difficulties um, so that would be difficulties seeing, hearing, walking, um, caring for themselves or communicating. Um, and anybody who reports having difficulties in at least one of these domains is classed as, as having functional difficulties. And you can see uh, quite big differences between those with and without functional difficulties. So for example, in, in North Macedonia, which is highlighted there, um, women with a, a disability were, were five times less likely to participate compared with women without a disability. Uh, and lastly, we also have data from UNHCR, which is the High Commission for Refugees, on the situation in, in refugee camps across, across Africa. Um, managing menstruation is, is particularly challenging uh, for the 2.6 million women and girls who are currently living in, in emergency settings. Um, and uh, UNHCR has set standards uh, which aims to ensure that at least 90% of women of reproductive age should be uh, satisfied with the materials and facilities available to them in refugee camps. But you can see here that while Mozambique and Iraq are, are meeting that standard, um, refugee camps in other countries are, are struggling to meet that, that target. Um, in the case of, of South Sudan, Malawi and Cameroon, um, less than half of the women in refugee camps were reporting that they were satisfied with um, menstrual materials and facilities. So still some, some big challenges in, um, in many countries. I'm just going to end with a, a couple of slides um, highlighting uh, some of the uh, big picture uh, issues that were that were highlighted in the, in the JMP report. So the next slide, Rick, please. Um, 
uh, just highlights that between 2000 and 2020, uh, there really have been you know, big changes. Uh, the global population has increased from 6.1 billion to 7.8 billion. Um, over that period, um, 2 billion people have gained access to safely managed drinking water. Uh, 2.4 billion gaining access to safely managed sanitation. And over the period for which we have data on global trends in, in basic hygiene services, so 2015 to 2020, um, half a billion people gaining access. So very large numbers of people uh, gaining access to services, and it's important not to lose sight of the progress that has been made. On the other hand, um, data availability um, has continued to improve. Since our last update, we have uh, data for a larger number of countries, and uh, the data are now covering a larger percentage of the population. So this table is showing you the, the number of countries with data and the percentage of the population that are covered by those data. You can see uh, that those in, in blue and green and purple have data for more than 50% of the population. Those that are highlighted in yellow are those where we still have data for less than 50%. And you can see, generally speaking, um, coverage is much better for basic services um, than it is for safely managed services. In the case of, of safely managed drinking water, um, globally, we still have data for less than 45% of the population. 138 countries, but it's still below that 50% threshold because we're lacking data for some of the, of the bigger countries like China and India. Um, when it comes to safely managed sanitation, um, we have uh, much higher data coverage, 81%, partly because we have uh, those large populous countries um, which have national estimates already. Um, but there's a, quite a big difference in terms of the coverage of data uh, for those uh, with sewer connections, um, where we do have reasonably good data on the treatment of, of wastewater, and those with septic tanks and pit latrines where we have very little data on um, what is happening to the waste, which is being emptied um, and taken away for treatment. So you can see that uh, um, safe management of wastes from on-site sanitation systems uh, is highlighted here as, as our single biggest data gap when it comes to, to national and global monitoring of the SDG WASH targets globally. Um, only seven countries have, have data on what is happening to the waste that's emptied from on-site sanitation systems, covering just 1% of, uh, of the population. So a lot of work to do, and this is where we need to focus our efforts going forward in order to be able to report on these uh, global indicators in future. Rick, back to you for um, a final discussion and a wrap-up. Thanks, Tom. And we do have a few minutes left to, to discuss generally how we can work together to strengthen national systems for monitoring these WASH indicators. We've had a number of specific questions in the, in the chat. Um, so I, again, encourage anyone to put up your hand or um, ask to speak or type something into the chat just while we uh, wait for additional questions about these general um, questions though. I do see there have been a couple of questions specific to the menstrual health. So one about just shock uh, about the discrepancies by income level and disability. Um, wondering what push organizations, including UN Water, WHO and UNICEF are doing to work on this. Um, I might say a few words uh, about what WHO is doing and then ask Tom to say something about UNICEF and other partners. And Tom, if you could also then maybe address the second question about uh, the data collected on menstrual health in refugee camps and you know, the, how that was actually done. So first on, on menstrual health within WHO, this is, um, I would say, a an area that's really growing fast. In fact, it's growing so fast that the terms keep changing. We've been talking about menstrual hygiene management and then menstrual hygiene. Um, and just this year, actually, a paper came out proposing a new definition of menstrual health. That's a, a broader consideration, which includes hygiene, but includes um, other aspects of health, including mental health uh, and well-being. So we use the term menstrual health, but we try to be specific about when we're speaking about 
menstrual hygiene and the management of materials and, and, and blood that's collected during menstruation. Um, and this is still an area that's emerging at WHO. There are definitely plans to develop more technical guidelines around uh, menstrual health services, uh, both in the household and in academic settings at schools or in healthcare facilities. We're anticipating that there might be guidelines coming out on this topic in, in a year or several years that give recommendations both about you know, the, the, the hardware, you know, what should the absorbency of pads be, what materials uh, can be used, how can cups be safely cleaned, but also on the programming approaches and how you can um, incentivize good menstrual health management uh, among different populations. Um, but Tom, maybe you could say a little bit about UNICEF's work in menstrual health. Yes, thanks, Rick. And this really is a, a growing area. I think when uh, we held the technical consultations on the priority areas um, to be addressed uh, for global monitoring of the, of the SDG targets, this was highlighted as a particularly important area. And under SDG target 6.2, you will see there's an explicit reference to uh, the needs of women and girls. And uh, a lot of the work that's been done on menstrual health and hygiene has been um, in order to respond to that call. Um, there have been uh, a number of, of guidelines produced um, in recent years on the types of indicators that can be used to inform programming. And uh, we have also supported the integration of these um, new questions into household surveys. So uh, the uh, questions um, that were developed uh, by the UNICEF multi-indicator cluster survey have now been picked up and adopted by other survey programs as well. And so we're starting to see more and more data uh, coming in. Um, I think we will continue to refine these questions and indicators as we analyze the data and it starts to raise more questions about the types of things that we should be measuring and monitoring. Um, but already, I think the data are, are quite, quite compelling and are really highlighting uh, challenges which have previously been uh, largely invisible. On the question of how UNHCR is collecting um, these data, the um, UNHCR runs these um, regular uh, surveys of the populations in camps. Uh, so they have monthly site reports and they also have a, an annual knowledge, attitudes and practice survey, um, which collects information from the populations living in the camps and uh, feeds that back in to their global dashboard. Uh, that's where we have extracted the data from. And that is now routinely collecting information on um, uh, menstrual health and hygiene. Uh, so that's a really important new source of data that previously didn't exist. Um, and then uh, there was one more question ah, on disability. So um, one of the important uh, challenges with disability is to be able to link information on, on drinking water, on sanitation and on hygiene with um, whether or not uh, a household has members who are disabled or whether there are individuals within that household who have particular disabilities. So um, we have some general information from household surveys now about uh, whether they contain uh, individuals with, with disabilities. But in the case of, of menstrual health, we're able to collect information on the individuals themselves and to record um, whether or not they're able to access materials or whether they um, are able to participate in activities uh, during their period and to link that to whether or not they have recorded having functional difficulties in, in any of these areas. So that is only possible in the case of a household survey where you're collecting both types of information and you also have a module on disability. There are relatively few of those, um, but the UNICEF uh, multi-indicator cluster survey is one of those which is incredibly powerful when it comes to analyzing uh, these types of inequalities. Thanks, Tom. There's definitely a lot of interest in these new data on menstrual um, 
health. And in fact, as you said, this is one of the few cases where we have data that's collected at the level of the individual. So we can really get into, you know, what, how many, how many specific people are having some level of, of service. We face a big challenge for um, a lot of the water sanitation and hygiene questions in that they're collected at the level of a household. So it's very difficult to say, you know, do what kind of intra-household inequalities there might be between uh, different uh, ages or people with or without disabilities, um, people of different sexes and genders. So, um, so we're, we're very happy to be able to explore those at least for menstrual health. Um, I see there's one other question about uh, the menstrual health data, and it's about the availability of menstrual materials. Um, the way the questions are asked in most of the surveys is, you know, asking um, women and girls what materials they used during their last menstrual period, and you know, uh, no materials or or um, uh, underwear or some things that aren't um, considered as menstrual materials are sometimes given as responses. But we don't have standard questions about um, whether when women and girls don't use menstrual materials, is it because they lack access to them, that the materials aren't available? Is it that they are available, but they're, they're, they're not affordable? Um, is it a cultural practice to, to not use them? So I think we would have to look at uh, more context specific uh, questions to get into the, the reasons about um, why menstrual materials might not be used by women and girls. We do have a little bit more data on availability of uh, menstrual materials in institutional settings. So if we look at schools or healthcare facilities, they will also often collect information about whether um, materials, pads and other materials are available or especially disposal facilities are available um, for used materials. Rick, there's also uh, a very uh, good uh, point which is made uh, from Alina in uh, Colombia, uh, talking about um, uh, work she's doing with uh, indigenous communities in, in parts of Colombia around menstrual health uh, and highlighting the fact that uh, some of the factors which will determine uh, what women and girls can and can't do are very highly uh, culturally context specific. Um, and so uh, it's important to find ways to uh, capture that in data collection. Um, in our report, we found a very interesting example from the poll where there are very specific things um, that uh, women and girls are allowed to do or not allowed to do during their periods. Um, to do with eating and bathing and uh, also to do with having to stay in separate rooms of the house or even in separate um, buildings uh, during their menstruation. Uh, so these things uh, are um, context specific, um, but there are also ways of capturing um, whether or not uh, there are constraints uh, to participation in a, in a standardized way to be able to highlight them across countries. So that's definitely an area of work that will continue. And we hope to be able to highlight more and more of these examples in, in future JMP reports. Thanks, Tom. Yes. And again, this is an emerging area that we're all very excited about. So we're coming up to the close. Um, we still have time if people want to make one or two last inputs. Um, I also invite our colleagues on the panel from PAHO, Patricia from PAHO, and Farai from UNICEF uh, Regional Office in Eastern and South, uh, Eastern and Southern Asia. Um, if, if there were any final thoughts or reflections that you had that you wanted to share. Yes, Rick, if I may come in. Please, go ahead. Yes, uh, I think um, particularly on achieving the SDGs, we still do have uh, some time going forward. Um, the, the, the last 10, well, nine years to go now uh, of the SDGs. And we also have the SDG midterm review also coming up. And it gives us really an opportunity to, um, to recourse um, and really find our bearing in terms of 
what we want to achieve in the next uh, nine years. So it's really important for, for countries to really take stock of where they are and really say what is needed for them to move forward and attempt to reach uh, these very ambitious targets. Um, and, and the midterm review actually allows us that opportunity. Um, over back to you. Yes, it's a, a good opportunity for a stock take, um, and even not too early to be thinking about what will come after the SDGs. So um, perhaps there will be a proper SDG indicator on, or a post-SDG indicator on menstrual health if, if the, the methods have uh, evolved to that level. I see we do have one more comment about the, the data on menstruation. Uh, the question is if the data are specific to women and girls, or also include non-binary menstruating people, for instance, trans men. And uh, Tom, you might wanna jump in as well, but I, I think the answer would be, it really depends on the household survey and the training that the enumerators are given. There are certainly countries where there's, there's a recognition of non-binary status. Uh, you might think of India or Thailand or some of the uh, South American countries where surveys record um, you know, non-binary uh, genders. And in those cases, um, I would expect that the questions around menstruation would be asked of, of anyone who menstruates, whether they identify as uh, male, female, or something else. Um, having said that, I haven't come across any data sets that do have uh, the menstruation data uh, disaggregated by other than male, female. Um, so I think that's something that we may see more of uh, in the future, but we just haven't yet. Um, and of course, non-binary, um, the, the, the issue of access to menstruation facilities and toilet facilities in general in schools and healthcare facilities um, has a lot of resonance with, uh, with the issue of non-binary people. So we do try to highlight examples uh, wherever we can find them in, in our reports of countries that go a little bit beyond and address some of these uh, important issues. Yes, there is a, a, a reference to this in, in the guidance uh, that was developed on, on monitoring uh, menstrual health and uh, Generally, uh, the information that's collected through household surveys tends to be limited to women and girls um, of, of reproductive age who report having menstruated in the last 12 months because it's coming through the women's questionnaire. Uh, but of course, in, in schools and in healthcare facilities, uh, it's possible to collect data from a you know, wider group. So uh, information can potentially be co collected from, from anybody uh, who reports uh, menstruating. Um, but this is a, an evolving area where um, there are you know, big differences between uh, national monitoring systems and the extent to which uh, they are covering different population groups. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see how this, how this develops. Um, and in future, hopefully it will um, you know, be inclusive of, of all menstruators, um, not just um, uh, women and girls. Thanks. It's great to see so much interest in the menstrual health. Um, our time is up now, so I'm going to um, thank everyone who participated. Thank you to our panelists for joining us from around the world. I posted uh, in the chat the link to the JNP website, washdata.org, where you can find more information about the methods that we use, and of course, all of the reports, including the core questions and the most recent um, data on households. Let's have also a big thanks for the translators who have been working so hard and have another webinar to get to right away. So um, thanks very much, translators. And uh, we will encourage you all to join the other webinars throughout the rest of this week to learn about the rest of SDG 6. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.